in your prayers. Okay, so we are halfway through the Gospel of Mark, and last week we arrived, finally arrived at the all-important question where Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter, answering on behalf of all of the disciples, said, you are the Christ. Now, why did it take eight chapters for them to finally arrive at this revelation? Or some scholars say that from chapter one to chapter eight represents two and a half years of Jesus' earthly ministry. So why did it take two and a half years of miracle upon miracle, incredible teaching after incredible teaching for them to finally arrive at that particular point? And as we saw last week, it was because they, as well as us, are spiritually blind. And we saw that through the miracle of Jesus healing the blind man, that he has also come to overcome our spiritual blindness. By his grace and mercy, he has come to open our spiritually blind eyes so that we can see him for who he truly is, so that we can believe in him for who he truly is. Now... No sooner have they arrived at this amazing truth when the next challenge comes along. And so listen to me, uh, we need to know this. From here on out for the next half of the book, things are only going to get more intense. Mark's gospel is only going to ramp up even more, none more so than today, because today we are asking the question, is it worth the cost to follow Jesus? More specifically, is the cross worth the cost. Not only does Jesus have a cross to bear, but so do you and I as we follow him. But the question, is it worth the cost, is the question we ask ourselves in other areas of life as well. I mean, we live on a beautiful island, and those winter breezes are about to start or have started, which is going to make this place even more special. But even here in paradise, there's a cost that we have to weigh up. Literally, uh, there's a cost Uh, of living that we have to weigh up. I mean, this place is not the cheapest place to live, right? Uh, Janine and I were in a shop this past week, and we were just simply looking to buy a a pair of pants or two, and we were kind of taken aback at the price. We're like, what? Is this for five pairs or just one? Uh, It turns out just one. Um, Now, for some reason, I felt very guilty doing this. I don't know if you guys do this. I don't know if this is right, but what we started doing was we like covertly started taking photographs of the brands and the sizes so that we could then go back home and check what the price was on Amazon. And so obviously the security guard saw the guilty look on my face and he began to follow us around, so I, I stopped doing that. Anyway, we got home and uh, we checked them out on Amazon and found that they were way cheaper, but then that left us in a bit of a quandary. Like, do you buy them on Amazon and then wait three to four weeks and then pay duty on top of that Uh, And then you think, well, to to make it worth our while, let's see what else we can buy and ship in on Amazon. And then before you know it, your your Amazon cart is kind of like overflowing. And so, you know, what started out is just initially to go off to the shops to buy at least one or two pairs of pants. Now you've got this Amazon cart that's overflowing. And so you, you literally have to weigh up the cost. Which cost is more worthwhile you know, we can, we can buy a few items on Ireland and have them immediately, or you can buy more stuff on Amazon for the same price, but then you have to wait three or four weeks and then pay duty on top of them. But like we said, this question doesn't only relate to what we buy, it also uh, easily refers to other areas in our, our lives as well. I mean, let's say you get offered a promotion at work and you, you have to weigh up the cost. You know, if I take it, there will be a significant jump in salary and, and, you know, not to mention recognition for all of your years of hard work, but at the same time, it will also mean significantly more responsibility and therefore maybe more stress, more anxiety, maybe even more time away from friends and family. And so, it's a challenging question. But let me tell you the secret to the question. The secret is not to fixate on the word cost. The secret is to fixate your your, 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 uh, your attention on the word worth. Is it worth the cost? Cost has too many negative connotations and it stirs up too many negative emotions. But But that word worth stirs up things like, well, what do you value in life? What are you valuing in your your life? 
What is most worthwhile to us at the end of the day? What has gripped the affections of our hearts and is so incredibly important to us? When we discover that, then the cost becomes easier. So for example, out of our, out of our love for our girls, we make sacrifices for them all the time. We sacrifice our time, our money, our energy, because we want the best for them. And underneath that, underneath those sacrifices is this love. It's undergirded. And so we make the sacrifices because we, we want what's best for them. So as challenging as this text is going to be, because it's going to confront us with the question, is the cross worth the cost? And as we said, there is a cross for Christ to carry, and there is a cross for us to carry if we're going to follow him. But now remember, we're going to focus on the worth, not the cost. And if we can identify what we value most, we will then carry the cross. So let's read it together. Mark chapter 8 from verse 31 just to verse 38 says, and he, that's Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So can you see, just from our first glance there, where or what you find your worth in, or what is most valuable to you, is where you will carry your cross or not carry your cross. And so I think this text is going to help us see the worth in carrying the cost in following Jesus. So here's how we're going to tackle it. First, we'll look at the worth of the cross for Jesus, for him. And then secondly, we'll look at the worth of the cross for us as we follow Jesus. So number one, the worth of the cross for Jesus. So let's ask it like this. Why was dying on the cross worthwhile for Jesus? What was of such value, such importance, that he was willing to lay down his life? So let's get the answer from the text, okay? Let's look at verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. So the first thing we see here is, is this change in focus, this change in intensity in the Gospel of Mark. No sooner have the disciples' eyes been opened to the reality of who Jesus is, and now he begins to teach them of his plan and his purpose for coming in the first place. And notice he's teaching them this plan and this, this purpose plainly, saying, guys, this is not a parable. I've taught many parables. This is not a parable. This is not metaphorical. This is real. This is going to happen. But the key word in that entire sentence that must have shocked the disciples is the word must. You see that? Not suffer or be rejected or be killed. Those, those words represent the cost. But that word must, it represents the worth. It represents the value. It's a loaded word. Like when I say, I must go to Foster's. It carries with it an intensity, right? It immediately begs the question, why? Or what is so important that you have to go to Foster's? What is, what is the need that needs to be fulfilled? 
And if we use that word must in connection with fosters in our household, it's usually related to coffee. To not have coffee in our house would be catastrophic. So here's what I'm saying. The worth and the value and the love for coffee supersedes the cost and the mission to go all the way to Foster's and buy the coffee. So what was the worth that drove Jesus to say he must go to the cross? I know you're thinking, Jason, just get on with it. It's out of his love for us. And so, yes, we would be right in saying that, but I don't think that was the first and only thing that caused this must in him. I think the worth and the value that drove the must in Jesus was his love, his devotion, and his commitment to his Father and his Father's will. Have a look at this. John 6.38 It says, For I, that's Jesus, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. So Jesus is saying, I am placing more worth, more value in the will of my Father than my own. And that comes out of an eternal, perfect bond of love with the Father. Then... Out of that, following that, following that love and devotion comes a love and a commitment and a devotion to save those whom the Father will give him and he will raise them up on the last day, as the verse says. It's an incredibly powerful verse. So out of his great worth in the love for the Father, he's willing to pay the price not just for the cross, that's how he will save us, but even before that, to leave the perfection of glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He's willing to leave perfect fellowship that he has enjoyed for all eternity with the Father and the Spirit and take on human flesh and come down. We see this again most powerfully just before he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Look at this, Luke 20, verse 42. He says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now here, I think the cost is at the forefront of his mind. And I, I, I don't just think he's thinking about the pain. I think what is worse is that by taking on, on the sin of the world, he knows for, that for the first time in all eternity, he will be separated from his Father. That's why he cries out on the cross, Why have you forsaken me? It's because the Father cannot tolerate sin. The Father cannot be in, in fellowship with sin. He cannot be united to sin. And so Jesus has become the spotless lamb that has come to take away the sin of the world. But what helped push through the cost? What helped him push through that cost? His love and devotion to the Father and the Father's will. That's why he says, nevertheless, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. One more to show you how the worth of going to the cross superseded another cost of the cross. Look at this, Hebrews 12, verse 2. It says, who for the joy, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I think, well, wait, 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 Jesus. Don't you know how shameful it is to die on the cross? It was reserved for the worst of the worst, the insurrectionists and for thieves. Don't you know that you'll be stripped completely naked for all to see? Not before they torture you. Not before they, they, they rip the skin out, the flesh out from your bones with whips that have been designed to do exactly that. And don't you know that the cross was designed to kill you by asphyxiation, that is suffocation. In order for you to take a breath, you would have to push down on those nails that would have been driven through your feet and your hands just so that you can get a little bit of breath. Are you sure you want to pay that cost? And yet what does the verse say? 
for the joy set before him. He endured the cross. Because he knew not only was he fulfilling his beloved father's will and reconciling you and me to his father, but when he got through it, he would be back at the right hand of his father. And to get there would mean that he would have triumphed over sin, death, and the devil. And he knew that he would have paved the way for us to be with him for all eternity. Knowing all of that caused so much joy, he triumphed over the shame over the cross. And so all of that love, all of that devotion, all of that passion is sitting under that little word, must. I must go to the cross. But now, not everyone understood that. It's taken eight chapters, two and a half years, for the disciples to understand who Jesus is, but now they need to begin to understand what Jesus was about. So have a look at verse 32. It says, And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. I mean, can you imagine that? You've just come to the realization of who Jesus is, and now you're rebuking him. You're putting the Messiah, the Christ, the Lord and Savior of the world in his place. It's like, come now, Jesus. Mm -mm. We ain't going to have that negativity around here. Right? Just positive thoughts. We can see from that that he only heard the rejection and death part because Jesus said plainly, after three days, I will rise again. Like, that, that disappeared somewhere. Peter and his disciples, they get who Jesus is, but they don't quite understand the what just yet. And so Jesus now is going to start putting that straight. Have a look at verse 33. But turning and seeing his disciples, so he sees this now as an opportunity to teach all of his disciples a lesson. They need to begin to understand the worth and the importance and the value of the cross. And so he says this. He rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of man. Now, I don't know about you. When I used to read that, I always used to feel sorry for Peter. I'm like, no, 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 Jesus. He, he's, he's just doing it out of love. He loves you, and he's being protective over you. But that's just the thing. We can't truly see what's going on. Because if you look at Jesus' response, he says that what Peter has just said needs to be behind him. It can't be in front of him. Otherwise, it's going to be a stumbling block. It will cause Jesus to swerve off his, his father's path, his father's will. But the most shocking element of all is that it's attributed to Satan. And I'm thinking, why? And the reason he gives, he says, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So Peter just what Peter just said is an example of setting your mind on the things of man, which Jesus also attributes to Satan. And so therefore, there's this synergy between man-centered thinking and satanic thinking, and that is for Jesus not to go to the cross. Peter's thinking, no, 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 wait, 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 Jesus. You are the long-awaited Christ. You finally arrived. You finally here. And so you, you, you're here to set the nation of Israel free. And, and, and we... We still see this even after the resurrection of Jesus in Acts chapter 1 verse 6. It says this, so when they, that's all the disciples, had come together around Jesus, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So Jesus has just risen from the dead, and the first and major thing on their minds is, okay, so the whole cross thing, that was weird, and, and then you rose from the dead, which was amazing, so now that that's all out the way, are you now going to restore our nation? Are you, are you going to set us free from Roman rule and occupation and make the nation of Israel great again? And the devil wouldn't mind that. He's thinking, fine. That way I, I, I remain undefeated. Everyone remains under the condemnation of their sin. No hell and no judgment for me. You can go ahead and reestablish the nation of Israel, just don't establish the kingdom of God. And so when it comes to our question here of the cost of the cross being worth it, 
the devil has a lot riding on it. And the Jews wanting the Christ to reestablish the political entity of Israel, they've got a lot riding on it not to happen as well. So what does Jesus have to do? He has to expose this way of thinking or this anti-cross thinking or this self-centered thinking. Meaning if we are going to follow him for who he is, that means following him to his cross so that we can uh, benefit from the cross he bears. But in doing that, we will also have a cross to bear. There will also be a cost for us. So let's look at the last point together, the worth of the cross for us. So uh, when we go on, on uh, long road trips to Savannah and West Bay, we like to play the game, the, the would you rather game. And we start easy, we, you know, we say things like this, you know, would you rather be a doctor or a pilot? Would you rather be a fish or a bird? And you kind of have to explain why and things like that. And then we take it up a notch and we say stuff like, would you rather be a billionaire but you live alone in Iceland, or be poor and happy with friends and family in New York. So in each case, there's a pro and a con, and you have to kind of weigh up which is more important to you. Where does your, your worth and your, and your value lie? Now watch how Jesus takes the would you rather game to a whole new level. Look at verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And then he says this, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. So which would you rather do? Save your life or lose your life? And if you want to save your life, then there are some serious implications you need to weigh up and consider. It begins with becoming a disciple of Jesus. That is to, to recognize who Jesus is, for who he is, and believe in him as your Lord and Savior. But that only kickstarts the process. Then things begin to get really real. Jesus says, this now means denying yourself. And what does that mean? It means to disown the same word was used when Jesus was arrested, and three times Peter was asked if he was a follower or a disciple of Jesus, and Peter utterly and unequivocally denied it each time. Remember how insistent he was, particularly after the third time, Matthew's gospel reports that he called down curses on himself and swore that he did not know the man. Let me be accursed, I promise you, I do not know that man. That's the intensity by which we are to deny ourselves. I don't know Jason. I don't want to know Jason. I don't want anything to do with Jason. But that can only come about when you make that initial decision of faith to become a disciple of Jesus. Because when you do that, when that happens... Our true sinfulness is exposed. Our eyes are opened to the beauty and the holiness of Jesus and our wretchedness in comparison to him. And in light of that, we repent. We turn 180 degrees, not just from our sinful acts, but from ourselves as sinners. It means to no longer be the determinator of your life. Not the terminator, the determinator of your life. We are to go from being the center for how and why and what and when we do the things we want to Jesus being the determinator of our lives. Warren Wiersbe says it like this. He says, from the human point of view, we are losing ourselves. But from the divine perspective, we are finding ourselves. When we live for Christ, we become more like him. And paradoxically, this brings out our own unique individuality. And it's so true. You look at uh, the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul. 
Both were being conformed into the image and likeness of Jesus, but both were very, very different. Different in personalities, different in giftings, different in their callings. Paul to the Gentiles, Peter to the Jews. And the same is true for us. As we live for Jesus, as we are being sanctified into his image and likeness, our true identity comes through. Unique giftings, unique callings. The other aspect we have to ask ourselves regarding the worth of following Jesus is that we have to carry our cross. Now, yes, uh, this is connected to our self-denial. We are crucifying ourselves so that Jesus might have his way in us and, and through us. So that's what naturally comes to our minds when we think of the word cross. But for the crowd and the disciples, the first picture that came to their mind was the method of execution the Romans employed. And like we said earlier, there was a lot of physical pain associated with it, not to mention the, the shame and the humiliation. And so Jesus is alluding to the fact that following him might lead to your shame. It might lead to your humiliation. It might lead to your death and persecution. John MacArthur explains it like this. He says, The Romans crucified their victims in public along highways as a gruesome reminder of what happened to those who defied Caesar's imperial authority. Listen to this. Estimates suggest that as many as 30,000 Jews were crucified during Jesus' lifetime. Thus, when the Lord used a cross to explain the cost of discipleship, his audience knew precisely what he meant. Jesus' point was that those who desire to be his disciples, rather than seeking prosperity and ease, must be willing to endure persecution, rejection, hardship, and even martyrdom for his sake. Now, you and I, we might not be killed for our faith, but maybe the guy who you know, shares your office cubicle might ridicule you for your faith or, or your Instagram post where you profess loyalty to Jesus or to uh, some particular stance of morality, you know, it, may, it might get canceled, you might get canceled, you might be labeled a hater. And so at this stage, those are some of the crosses we may have to carry. Okay, so let's, let's leave that there for a second and return to the would you rather game, right? So remember, the other option is to lose your life, but, 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 you will gain the whole world and you will live the life that you want to live in the meantime, meaning you will become the self-determinator of your life. You, 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 can get, you can dictate the how, the what, the why, and the when of all that you desire to do and you won't be hated, you won't be persecuted, you won't be canceled. In fact, you can build a very comfortable lifestyle for yourself here and now. But Jesus, in his mercy, he wants us to have the full picture so that you and I, we can make a wise decision. So let's clarify what it means to lose your life. Look at verse 36. It says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? So Jesus gives us two rhetorical questions here to expose the greater worth and value, namely our souls. He's saying your soul is of more value than all the riches and the comfort in this world. There's nothing of more value in this world than your soul. He says you can't trade your soul for anything here, including this. Have a look at this. This is the super yacht called History Supreme. It is worth $4.8 billion dollars. Uh, it's made up of 100,000 kgs of platinum and gold. Apparently, the hull is wrapped in a layer of gold. You can't even use that as a bargaining tool to get you into heaven one day. I mean, can you imagine the conversation? Hey, Jesus, tell you what. You let me through the pearly gates, and you get this bad boy. <laughs> Trust me, take it for a spin. Jesus like, you realize I can walk on water. But anyway, now when Jesus returns, there will be no bargaining. When he returns, there will be judgment, as he says in verse 38. Look at this. 
For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now, we need to be careful in how we read this. Because there have been times in my life where I have been too afraid, even ashamed, to say something about Jesus or to stand up for Jesus or to, to stand up for my Christian values in a particular situation. And so does that mean that when Jesus returns, he's going to be ashamed of me? Well, if so, then Peter, who denied and was ashamed of Jesus three times, would be in serious trouble. But he went on to be one of the greatest Christian leaders who's ever walked this planet, not to mention the fact that he wrote two divinely inspired books of the Bible. No, the context here is so important. This is in the context of wanting to save your own life, to be the savior of your own life, to say, no, no, I've got this. I don't need no crucified savior. I can build my own kingdom. You know, look at everything I've achieved. Look at all the good that I'm doing. I don't need someone to save me. J.C. Ryle, he says this, the wickedness of being ashamed of Christ is very great. He says it is a proof of unbelief that you never believed in Jesus in the first place. It shows that we care more for the praise of men whom we can see than that of God whom we cannot see. So our assurance of salvation is not based on our witness, but on the finished work of Christ on the cross for us. Otherwise, our salvation becomes works-based and not faith-based. So here's how I want to finish off. In the beginning, we asked the question, is the cross of Christ that we have to bear worth the cost? And I said the secret to answering that question is not to focus on the word cost because that might freak us out because it, and it might drive us into absolute despair. Like, you know, how am I going to de deny myself? How do I know if I'm doing a good enough job? You know, what if I'm not carrying my cross adequately? You know, I just bought the new iPhone. Does that mean I've sold my soul into the world? What if I do want to buy a yacht one day? No, the secret is to focus on the word worth. Where am I finding my worth? Where am I finding all of my value? What is the love of my life? The answer to those things will determine the cross that we're carrying. See, we naturally and joyfully make sacrifices for the things we love and find value in. We naturally and joyfully follow and obey the things that we find worth and importance in. So what do we do? The one for whom we must carry our cross for must become the object of our joy. And to become the object of our joy, they must become the means of our joy. I know, Jason, it's Sunday, I need coffee. What does that mean? Let's go back to our parent illustration. If Janine and I are, to, are going to carry the cross for parenting our children, Paige and Emma, then our children must become the object of our joy. And in order for them to become the object of our joy, we need to be with them. They need to become the means as well. And so the more we with our children, the more they become our joy, and we naturally begin to make sacrifices for them. You're thinking, okay, but well, where do you see that in the text? And that's a good question. Always ask that question. Look at verse 35. It says, Forever would, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life, here we go, for my sake and the gospels will save it. There it is. So in other words, why would you be willing to lose your life? What could possibly be of more value, what could you be possibly enjoying more or loving more than your own life? Jesus and his gospel. And so how are you going to fuel your joy in Jesus and the gospel so that the cross you bear for them is worth the while, dare I even say, with joy? 
It begins with what we saw last week. An illumination as to who Jesus truly is. And faith in who he truly is. Followed then by a lifetime of growing in spiritual sight or spiritual insight and a relationship with him. And what will help is immersing ourselves in the enriching truth of the gospel. The gospel, by the way, is not just Jesus died on the cross for my sins. This whole book is the gospel. This whole book tells us the unfolding story of God's rescue plan for sinners like you and me. Jesus is the hero of it. It culminates in who he is and what he did for us on the cross. And as you and I, as we grow in our understanding of that, our hearts are filled with love and a joy and a focus and affection for Him, which results in joyfully carrying our cross for Him. Here's an aspiring verse that we can trust to be true of us. Galatians 6.14 says this, Paul writes, But far be it from me to boast... To boast. If you're going to boast in something, what, what, what's happened to you? Something's got hold of your heart. Like, I love this thing. Something's got hold of your mind. You just think about it all the time. And so you just naturally, you want to boast about it. It's grabbed hold of your mind and the affections of your heart. So he says, but far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then what follows? by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It begins with what you value most. What are you boasting in? So let's finish off. So who do you say I am? We can say from this episode, you are the Christ who joyfully endured the cross for me so that I might joyfully endure my cross in following you. You are the Christ who joyfully endured the cross for me so that I might joyfully endure my cross in following you. Let's pray together. Jesus, it begins with you. Thank you for, thank you that out of your love and devotion for your Father and your Father's will, that you joyfully endured the cross for us so that we might be in this very room right now and those watching online. Thank you for what you went through so that we might be reconciled to our Heavenly Father. And I pray, please, open our eyes even more to see that. And that our hearts would swell with gratitude, awe, and wonder at your grace and mercy toward us. So much so that our hearts fill up in love and devotion for you that the, the cost of following you seems like nothing. It's, in fact, it would be a joy to carry the cross that we have to bear in this world for being a disciple of yours. Become the all-encompassing worth and value of our lives. Be everything to us, Jesus, because you gave up everything for us. I'm asking you, please, don't let anyone leave this building or switch off after the sermon without having a little bit more illumination as to who you are, Jesus, and of your love and grace towards us, which translates into us joyfully carrying our cross for you in this world. Let it strengthen us. Let us stand firmly on who we are and what we believe so that others might be drawn to you and pick up their cross. Lord, I pray in particular for tomorrow at Kids Fest that we would be there carrying our cross 
on a day that celebrates darkness, we would be there carrying our cross of celebrating the light. Bring people, Jesus. Let them see you. Let them be convicted of their sin and let them be set free of their sin as they place their faith in you. Use us, use sunrise. We pray this in your name. Amen. Come on, standing one last time.